The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 15th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Then Jesus called the crowd to him and said to them, Listen and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but it is what comes out of the mouth that defiles. Then the disciples approached and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees took offense when they heard what you said? He answered, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind guides of the blind. And if one blind person guides another, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, Explain this parable to us. Then he said, Are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth enters the stomach and goes out into the sewer? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this is what defiles. For out of the heart come evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. When Jesus answered her, then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, my Lord, my rock, and my redeemer. Amen. Well, friends, there are some things that can be said, just a few simple words that have the power to change everything. I heard a few of those, those things being said in this past week, even just yesterday. Yesterday we celebrated a uh, wedding here of Noel Burke, for those of you who know Noel, and now Noel Bothorf and her husband Logan, with a, a few simple words, I do. Everything changed. Everything changed for them, and God made them into one flesh. Their lives now are inseparable and joined together in Christ Jesus. I also heard people say goodbye to their father and to their husband. Words that change everything. Nothing will be the same after those words are spoken. So few words and so much power. So much of life completely different for the sake of a few syllables spoken together. There aren't many statements like that that have the power to change. But there are, there are some. And we hear some of them spoken today. The Apostle Paul in the epistle reading he talks about the gifts and the calling of God. But he says a few words that if we take them to heart, if we really truly believe them, they change everything about the nature of how we understand God and how we understand our lives in Christ Jesus. They're important words. And after they have been spoken and the truth that they contain come to us, we have to be different. Something has changed. They are that powerful. And the words are this. God has consigned or constrained all people to disobedience. 
Now, I'll tell you what. Those words don't seem to jibe very well with most of our understandings about the nature of who God is and certainly who God is for us. Now, you know that I wasn't raised a, a, a Christian, but I, I certainly lived in this world, and I know a phrase that you know as well. The devil made me do it, right? <laughs> the bad things don't come from God. The good things come from God. God brings all the good stuff, right? And that's, that's terrific. Jesus brings that all to us. We love Jesus because isn't he just God pouring out blessings, blessings upon us over and over? And maybe the devil brings all of these bad things. And you know what? Maybe the world that we live in is chaotic for the sake of them fighting. But that is not our faith. Not at all. We believe in a God who is all-powerful and at the same time, all-loving. We believe in a God who is not far off as some of the founding fathers imagined, a God who simply wound up the world and set it on the ground to watch it scurry away to whatever destiny awaited it. But our God is close to us. Our God is one who we believe is here with his hands dirty, mixing and forming even our very lives. This God, this powerful God close to you, the scriptures tell us, has consigned us or constrained us to disobedience. Where is our room for such a God? You know, the world has plenty of room for this idea of God. I, I know this, and you know it as well. Perhaps in your own heart you have spoken these words, that when you see the way that things go, when things are not what they ought to be. And there is plenty to drive those concerns today. Perhaps you wonder, why would God allow this? Why would God do it? Why in the world, if God truly is all-powerful, doesn't he use that power to prevent the suffering that we experience in this life? Why would a God who is all-powerful and all-loving Permit us to go through the struggles that we go through, to go through the hardships and the pain. What could such a God be like? And what are we left to imagine about such a God if we really do believe those things about him, that he is near to us, that he is powerful, that he is loving? Perhaps he doesn't love us like we imagine. You see, those truths, they invite a certain suspicion about God, one that the world possesses in spades. And knowing that God is all-powerful, what we Christians claim to believe, and that we claim that God is all good, they see in here some contradiction that, that allows them to pronounce a death sentence on God, to say to God, if you are powerful, then you are not good, or if you are good, you are not powerful, because look at the world around us. Look at the ways that the world has fallen short of the expectations that even God himself claims at the very beginning of this book to have created that world for. And what do we have to say? It's a predicament. It's a predicament because we in our hearts have pronounced the same judgment. We have seen the ways that things fall short and we have looked outside of ourselves and, and looked to, to God to be a cure, to be one who should have prevented all of this from happening, who should have used his power in the way that we imagine we ourselves would use such power to prevent any type of bad from occurring. But God is to us a father, one who allows us to experience the consequences of action. And this is very important because consequences, be they positive or negative, they are those things which gives meaning to action and that allows life to have meaning. God will not deprive of us of those gifts. If there were no consequences to anything we did, then doing anything would not matter. But God would not place us into such a world. What we do truly does matter. And if that is so, then the truth of the matter is this that the ways that we fall short, they create the world that we abide in. 
and the suffering and the pain and the difficulty that we are so eager to offload from ourselves, to unburden from ourselves, and to place on the shoulders of God, though they don't belong there, they truly are ours. It is our sin, our failures, our myriad ways that we fall short, whether it is as a husband or a wife, a son or a daughter, a father or a mother, a neighbor, one to another, the ways that we destroy one another, the ways that we hurt one another, the ways that we bring pain into being in this world, into a world that is already filled with it, that we contribute to this. And so the pain and the the suffering in this world, it's multiplied. And it goes over and beyond the tragic nature of life because we have made it so. And all people stand guilty of this. You and I as Christians, absolutely. Everyone outside unwilling to, to accept the burden of their own, the consequences of their own actions. Those who desire to place it on the shoulders of another, they too, they too have built it. It seems that it must be true then that God has indeed consigned all people to disobedience. He's permitted us to go forth and to go on. And and if he is a father who allows consequences, perhaps he is a father like, like we are to our children or a father or a mother, knowing that when our child, if they put their hand on the hot stove, we might in our hearts desire to prevent them from suffering the pain that comes with those things. But if we were to get our way, we would know this as well. We would not be serving them at all. If we were to eliminate the consequences of those actions, we would only sentence them to a life of repetition, to experience the same suffering, the same mistakes, the same pain over and over and over without end. But God will not will this. Because those words, of course, do not end the sentence. God has consigned all people to disobedience, but so that he might have mercy on them all. It is God's will that he is known to you, not as the one who magically aligns things to be as though they were a fairy tale, but to come down into this world, the one that that he has blessed us with, but the one that we ourselves have contributed to its degradation. To our relationships that are broken, to the pain and the suffering, to the mourning and the loss that's inside each and every one of us as we consider the ways that this life has fallen short of our hopes and our expectations. And he comes down to save. This is the God that we have not a God who, who protects us from life itself, but one who saves us out of this mire into true life. One who sees the suffering and the pain and who is not far off sitting in judgment, but one who has come down so that he might participate in the same suffering and the same pain, the same mourning and the same loss, the same degradation of body and life that you and I we feel constrained and trapped in. That is Jesus Christ. That God has come down among us to live with us, to suffer with us, to feel what you feel, to know what you know. And for all of the world that desires to offload all of their judgment, and all of the consequence of their actions that they cannot embrace as being their own. They look for some other place to blame and they found Christ. But so did we. And they who would be rid of God have found in us a brotherhood For we ourselves in our sin have condemned Christ. But 
he has taken it upon his shoulders. He did not run from the blame, but he says, yes, I am all powerful. Yes, I am all loving. Watch me. And taking all of the sin of the world for both you yourselves, taking all of your suffering and all of your pain, all of the ways that we fall short, all of the ways that this life has not been what it was meant to be from the very beginning, God has borne those upon himself in his son, Jesus Christ. For all of those out there who do not yet know God as Savior through Jesus Christ, he bears even their sins upon himself that though they don't know it yet, they stand justified before God for the sake of Jesus Christ who is born upon himself all of the sin of the world, all of the ways that it has gone wrong. And it is. It is on the cross that those things are put to death and they died there with Christ. But the only thing to be raised was life. You see, these words change everything. God has constrained us to disobedience so that he might have mercy on us. And God has had mercy on you in Jesus Christ. Your sins now are forgiven. Your life is reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. Those things which you cannot bear, Jesus has borne. And the life that Jesus now lives is your life in Christ Jesus. The past that, that we know was not what it should have been will now be the future that will be what God desires. And God will be known as Savior. Let us pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you that you, Lord, are a Savior. Not one far off, but one, one near who has come down to suffer with us, for we suffer, but who has come down to save that we might live. Lord, bless you for this gift. Help us to share it with this world that they might receive those same things that we have received from your hand, the salvation of our souls. In Jesus' name, amen.